Hey guys, it's Bill from Linden, Tennessee. So last time we talked, I talked a little bit about batteries and energy densities and stuff. Um, so these, these are the six volt lead acid storage batteries that came out of that little um, uh, little cart that I'm converting for my uncle-in-law. And so these are Trojan 145s and they have a 10 hour um, capacity rating of 240 amp hours so that means for 10 hours you can pull 24 amps you can pull 24 amps for 10 hours straight and you will end up with uh, in the last few 10 hours that's when they're brand new uh, the second time you try and do that you'll get 239.7 uh, or you can you know you'll, you'll get 9.9 .9 hours and then the next time will be 9.7 hours and then uh, you know a year from then it'll be seven hours but anyway uh, the a nasty thing about lead acid is is that each time you deep cycle them uh, that is to say from full to zero percent state of charge um, pulling that full 240 amp hours each time you do that it damages them so it's strongly recommended to not ever pull full power or pull full capacity from a lead acid. They always they, they say that if you do half 50% capacity, then you're kind of in there. So um, what we're looking at here is if you take that 240 and then you multiply it times the 56 volts that you would uh, charge these to, mm, you end up with 12-ish kilowatt hours of energy. So it's you know it's it's a lot, but since you can only use half of it, you know it's six. We'll call it six. Um, and each one of these eight batteries weighs 72 pounds, and then 72 times eight is uh, like almost 600 pounds. So it's really heavy. I mean, you can see how the thing is like these are these are bending my trailer. Um, but anyway, so that's those. Hold, please. Okay, and here is the cub. We're going to talk about this more, but this is the new battery design that I've got. Going on. Uh, these are uh, CALB, C A L B C A 100s. So each one of these cells is rated at 100 amp hours. So you could pull 100 amps for one hour, 50 amps for two hours, 20 amps for five hours, etc. Uh, and then all of these are going to be um, in series. So this is 16. So this is going to have a charge voltage just like the lead acid of 56 volts. And 56 volts times 100 amp hours is uh, 5.6 kilowatt hours. So just a little bit less capacity than those lead acid batteries we just looked at. All of these, each one of these cells weighs about seven pounds. Seven times 16 is uh, four, <laughs> seven, eight. Yeah, seven times 16 is uh, what, 112? 112. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. It's less, a lot less than 700. And with lithium iron cells, you can safely uh, fully discharge them. So from fully charged to 0% state of charge. And you can do that over and over again for like, I don't know, some of them are, I've seen as high as 7,000 charge cycles. And uh, at the end of those 7,000 charge cycles, you'll have, they, you know, they claim 80% capacity 80 percent of original capacity so if these are 100 amp hour cells now you'll have 80 amp hours and uh, you can do the math to figure out what your degradation has been uh, i mean just think about 7,000 charge cycles for a while let's say this cub when i get done with it i can cut the grass for two hours two hours straight that's 14,000 hours uh, of cutting grass now uh, that last you know the 13,999, I probably won't be able to get the full two hours because I'd be, you know, I'd be approaching that 80% of the original. But anyway, you see what I'm saying? It's 14,000 grass cuttings is a tremendous amount. If, you know, you cut the grass for, say, four months out of the year and you do it once a week, that's 16 times a year. That's a thousand years <laughs> worth of cutting the grass. So, you know, once this cub is done... There will be no reason ever for me to change these batteries out. 
Um, other than the fact that manufacturing tolerances, every once in a while, one of these will go bad. Um, you, you can just, they just do sometimes randomly, you can lose a cell and that's pretty annoying. But what, I, what the point is I'm trying to make is these will last a very, very, very long time. So that's the, now if we come over here, huh, these are the Tesla modules that I was going to use. Uh, these are composed, each one of these is composed of 444 little, um, they're called 18650s, but they're, they're just, think of them as like big AA batteries. So there's 40, 440, <laughs> there's 444 of those in each one of these modules. Each one of these modules is 24 volts. And when you combine them together, they have a charge voltage of 49.2. That's very different than the charge voltage of a lead acid or a 16 series lithium iron phosphate 56 volts. Um, and I bring that up as sort of a, for anybody who's watching this, if you have or know somebody who has or you want to have an off-grid house or cabin or anything that's charging your batteries off of solar you need to be and you think you want to use these tesla modules that's fine they are okay they they are not going to just self combust um but if you don't get your um charge currents correct on your charge controller with your solar i'm digressing a little bit i'm sorry but a friend of mine this just happened to he went from lead acid batteries similar to the ones on the trailer and then he bought a couple of these and unfortunately he didn't know that he needed to change his charging characteristics from 56 volts down to 49.2 and uh and it's just that's just cat cat catastrophic it's catastrophic because these each of these little 18650 cells they will uh turn into little roman candles and like i mean that quite literally they they just shoot little fireballs of energy out of them uh, and the worst part about these things is that whenever they start to burn, a combination of the cobalt that's in them and the electrolyte that's used and whatever, they uh, you, they generate their own oxygen. So once they start once they start uh, on fire, you can't put them out. You can like throw them in water and they continue to burn. So they really they need your respect, uh, and you need you need to know what you're doing. It's kind of like playing with a rattlesnake. People own rattlesnakes as a pet and they can carry them and they can kiss them on their little rattlesnakes heads. But if you do not know what you're doing, you need to, you need to be very careful with these things. Um, I, I, my heart goes out to Jay and his family. Um, you know, that their shed, it, it burnt down to the ground. Like there was, there's nothing left of it. It's, it's, a, it's phenomenal really what happens. There was a side by side next to him that burnt down to the ground. Half of a cabin they had next to that. It, it burnt down to the ground. It's just, it's tragic. Um, so I, you know, I, I bring all this kind of up, first of all, to show you the difference in size comparisons between the different chemistries, but also to bring up the fact that these things are dangerous and they deserve your respect. So PSA over. So these, each one of these is uh, 50 pounds, 52 pounds, and each one of these has about five and a half kilowatt hours. So we're talking the same energy dense energy as the lead acid and the lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate weighed 120 pounds. These weigh 52 pounds. So, you know, it's half again the power, or half again the weight. And then, so you'd need two of these to make a, a nominally 48 volt pack. But when you put two of these together, you have 11 and a half kilowatt hours worth of energy, which is twice what I have in the lithium iron phosphate. So this is 100 pounds with twice as much energy as lithium iron phosphate. And our lithium iron phosphate has as much energy as lead acid at a sixth of the weight. So that's the generation of batteries where we're at. And the newer ones that come out, they'll have more energy density than these ones. And as time goes on, that trend will continue because that's what happens with technology. Um, things just get better. And up until now, there hasn't been a demand for a better battery. But now that EVs are coming on the scene, uh, it's going to happen. And before you know it, you know, you'll be able to get a, a battery that's the same size as my Jeep battery, 90 kilowatt hours, and, you know, it'll fit in a suitcase and it'll weigh, you know, 200 pounds or something. So, yeah, it's coming. It's pretty exciting. It's a fun time to be a car guy.
Speaking of car guy, this is back to the back to the cub. Um, I want to bring up another uh, YouTuber, new YouTube channel. It's called Ver Electrified Veronica. It's Don Wright and Veronica, Don and Veronica Wright, and uh, they're a couple on YouTube, and they are also converting a Jeep Wrangler. Theirs is a 1999, mine's a 97. It's the same thing, but they're converting a Jeep Wrangler, and they're using some really high spec parts. They're using batteries out of a Mach E, Ford Mach E, I think, and they're using a, a motor. It's called Cascadia, Cascadia Motion. It's really good. They're using really, really good uh, solid equipment. It's going to be a fantastic build when they get it done. What I want, what I bring them up for is because they take a different method to building than I do. Um, their method of building is, is they get the machine, they get the, the donor, they strip it down to bare metal, and they put these little white dots all over it, and then they have a company come in with an imaging camera, and it renders a 3D digital uh, animation of their entire Jeep in its naked form on their computer. And then from that, they can design, say, battery boxes or the placement of the charger or, you know, whatever. They can design all that stuff, motor mounts, and, and then they can get uh, 3D, or they can get prints that they can take and send to a, a company to have parts laser etched or, or fabricated or whatever. And then they can just kind of all bolt it together and, you know, in theory it'll work. And that's one way of doing it. And I, I admire them for doing it that way. I think it's really cool. And I'm watching their build uh, pretty closely because I, I want to see how this all comes out. Because that's not my way of doing things. <laughs> it's not because, uh, well it is, it's because I've never tried doing it that way. And I don't know how to do it that way and I don't really care to learn to do it that way. My way is by uh, writing something is sitting and looking at it for a little while, coming up with 10 different ideas in my brain, trying to make all the stuff in my brain move and see how things might interfere. And then writing something down on paper, talking to friends, getting different ideas, and then ultimately at 2 o'clock in the morning coming up with what I think will be a good working idea, then the next morning come out here and do it. And that is that is almost literally what has happened here. So my steering of this is what the problem is. Uh, how, how do you turn this thing? I'm going to have a seat back yonder and I'm going to have a steering wheel. So I'm going to actually be sitting over the back wheels. A lot of these uh, articulating tractors that people make, they'll sit over the front wheels and they all use hydraulic steering, almost, almost unanimously use hydraulic steering because they all use engines and the engines have a hydraulic pump on it anyway. So they just take some of that uh, hydraulic pressure and, and put it into a, a steering ram and you know, that's what they do. I don't have that luxury, so I come with something else. And what I've come up with is using a linear actuator. Linear actuators are kind of neat. Uh, I mean, you know, people, I'm sure you've seen a linear actuator, but what happens is electricity goes in the wire. It turns a little electric motor there. It's got some gears. It's got a um, sort of a screw in there, and when the gears turn, that screw retracts that uh shaft, piston, whatever, retracts that in, and then you reverse that current into the motor, and then it it's, spits it out again. Um, some of these are fast, some of these are slow, most of them are slow. Some of them are really, really powerful, and uh, this one, I think, has a 300-pound lift capacity, and its speed is 10 millimeters per second, so uh, what's that? Like less, just, it's less than a half of an inch per second. So, uh, it's not particularly fast, but you can compensate for that speed if you need to, by changing your ratios on, on the levers that it's actuating upon. And that's what I'm playing with right here now. And, uh, this is just some parts I had. These, these little rod ends are just parts I had laying around there. Now they're not beefy enough for actual, when this thing's actually ready to go and start turning but they are good enough for uh, proof of concept. I had some holes in the frame. What you're looking at now is about the fourth iteration, maybe fifth iteration of this that I've gone through today. Um, and whenever I hit about the fifth or sixth iteration, I start wondering if the electrified Veronica way might not be <laughs> something I should check into. Because um, if I could render all this onto a 3D CAD model on the computer, uh, and, and run it through a cycle of turning left and right and articulation in the front, articulation in the back, you know, it, it would speed up this process a lot. 
because what I'm finding, and I can show you now, is this looks cool. Oh, so, so here's what I was thinking about doing. So we take this, this linear actuator and you stick it roughly there or something somewhere, and then it would actuate on that right there. So this would actuate on that. This would be up here. So it would have a, you know, it push on that. And then when it pushes on that, it goes through this uh, beefier rod, transmits the torque over to this arm out here. That arm pushes the pushes or pulls the front of the chassis, but at the same time, equal and opposite reaction pushes or pulls the back half, back half, and it makes things turn. So, let's see if I can't simulate this a little bit, but um, what I'm what I'm discovering is is that as this goes through its motion, the angles uh, start changing pretty dramatically. So, uh, as you can see right now, it's it's pretty well lined up, everything's cool. Then as soon as you go into a turn, now all of a sudden I've run out of travel because the, the frame is like this, the rod is like this. So now I've run out of travel and the same, same goes up here. So this rod needs to, needs to be able to come out this way more, if that makes sense, uh, as it goes through more trap, more of a turn. And you can do that. And I will do that. What I'll do tonight is I'm going to go on to McMaster car and I'm going to buy some um, rod ends that are more like this. You see how it's got like that little shoulder on the bottom of the rod ends and what that allows is the uh, heim joint to have more articulation I guess you'd call it. Uh, the other thing to notice is um, the, the how much this moves back. So this needs to come together um, you know say say that the total travel between uh, full turn left and full turn right is eight inches so that means whenever you turn left this rod needs to come back four inches whenever you turn right this rod would come forward four inches so um yeah what was i saying uh, uh, uh i don't know so this this distance right here is important uh this angle here is important I think what's going to end up having to happen is this heim joint now, let's just call it vertical. It's going to end up needing to be more horizontal, maybe at, even at an angle, 45 or 50 degrees or something. I don't know. Uh, this one, this one is probably going to be able to stay vertical like this because its action is just mostly forward and backwards, whereas this one is more like this. <laughs> and that may not make sense, but just playing with this mostly all day, I've kind of discovered that, that this one is probably going to need to be more horizontal. Um, and I don't think that the articulation, um, like if a, the front or back tire goes up over a bump, I don't think that's going to play as big of effect on these um, joints as I thought it was going to. So that's good. That was one of my big concerns. But, you know, this is just one of those things that uh, you simply don't know how it's going to work until you you get down there and you try it. Mm. So, yeah. So this is just fun stuff, just playing around. Um, and I may never actually get it 100% right, but eventually I will get it working. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to keep noodling at this and working on it and trying to come up with other designs. Um, Maybe I'll even look into a 3D CAD program mm, with motion. I don't know. It's probably not a bad idea. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to my little um, rant about batteries and, and being safe out there. So um, we'll see you next time.